All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone who's watching us today. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with you. Uh, my name is Vladimir Shulak. Uh, I'm working uh, as a data science manager. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to be hosting uh, William Arias with his amazing talk, uh, which is about um, building automation of machine learning workloads with uh, DevOps. Uh, super excited to have him here. He's not the first time uh, with us on this conference, so uh, very excited to see sim uh, familiar faces with, with us. Um, and uh, just uh, wanted to probably ask a quick question to start. So William, uh, my question to you, I see that your topic right now is uh, about machine learning workloads and DevOps. Like in my world, I think we call it MLOps. Why do you actually divide these two terms? Okay. Thank you, Vladimir, and thank you, everyone who is here. I'm also happy to be sharing with you. Um, very good question, and the reason is that I'm trying to be conservative. I believe that the MLOps field is still discovering itself, and if you read the literature and papers that we have available so far, there is still no agreement, like the same agreement that we have with DevOps. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that you can learn is that when you read the literature about what makes MLOps, MLOps, I will say that my personal take is that MLOps is a subset of DevOps. Um, people who come from software engineering background, mm -hmm. they already can do a lot of things without buying a product mm -hmm. that is made for MLOps. So um, having said that, I would like to call it with DevOps because I am not using any MLOps platform. What I found is that you don't have to buy a full-blown MLOps platform to start uh, automating, um, uh, achieving uh, quick wins for machine learning applications. You can just use DevOps to a big extent. A one ongoing discussion that I have seen in different meetups and events just last week in Singapore, and the Cloud Expo, we were discussing how it's important for the data scientists or machine learning engineers to actually learn the basics of software engineering so they don't reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. Because many of them, they are saying, oh, we can do this and that. And yes, that has been done in software engineering in the last decade. So we can adopt those practices into machine learning applications and we can add new things there are things that we can discuss later around things that are out of the scope. I will narrow the challenges that I want to address here. And my intention is not to give an answer that with this, you have MLOps or with this, you are covered. No, my, I will unfold what is my answer, but it's, that, it's intentional, my name, with the WOPs and not calling it MLOps. But that's, that's kind of the goal, mm -hmm. Go, get in there. Yeah, you have some good points there. Yeah, totally agree with you on the fancy MLOps platforms and that you can actually do a lot of things with the tools, which we know. Yeah, totally agree with you. Uh, just uh, for the audience, I wanted to remind that we have a chat basically for you to ask questions during the talk. And it's my obligation, uh, if you will, to read through that and uh, summarize it if you feel like asking questions in a different language other than English. That's also fine. And I'll try to help interpret that, uh, that, and after that, we'll have a discussion. Uh, so just uh, come, please, and we'll have another discussion after the, the, the talk. And with this being said, I guess it's the time to just give you the opportunity to present now. So let's start. OK, thank you. And thank you, everyone, again. So in unfolding this, and thank you, Vladimir, for the question. It's a great segue. Um, I want to start by the outline, so you know what is coming up. Um, this outline, sometimes I put it in the beginning or sometimes at the end, depends on which culture I am presenting. <laughs> so I am told that on this side of the world, you, you need structure from the beginning or at the end. So we will start with why, why are we doing this? Why am I doing this? And why do I want to share what I've been working on with you? 
And to answer that why, I will walk you through the challenges that I have been solving and how I use them in real life, in my job, in my hobby projects, and different things when I serve as a consultant. And I will show you how I am solving this challenge. And I wanted to divide it into challenges, so we will go through two of them, and then I will show you how it looks like using the platforms that I'm using. So starting with why, I wanted to deviate a little bit and, and tell you that uh, for this event, I couldn't do my usual opening of the demo because I like to use what I build in my presentations. So there was a, um, there was a, a demo in which I wanted to read the, the, um, the sentiment of the audience. So let's say that if I ask you to tweet with this hashtag, I could see how it evolves throughout time, the sentiment around what I am presenting. But there are no hashtags with this presentation. So let's say that if we do, we use the WOPs. So what I'm doing right now here is basically I will start walking you through in this. This is one thing that we use in my team, and is that we have been starting analyzing. What is the response of people when it comes to sentiment analysis and emotion when we present? A big part of my job is doing evangelization. So we would like to, to, to you know, get, generate a report. So while we speak here, this is a, a application that was deployed and I will go into details of the architecture. It was deployed in a Kubernetes environment, it's cloud native and it has a backend with ML. And all of these things that get built here, they are deployed to different environments. It is running with, with very limited hardware because we are in a staging, a staging environment. And we have basic things. One of the values that we move in my team is that we want to iterate fast. So we just say, just let's start building the infrastructure and let's put something. And then with the pass of time, we iterate and we improve it. So with this, having said this, I will start moving. And I said that you can see we, we extracted some tweets about DevOps. And if I were in a conference that has its its own hashtag, I could be monitoring in almost in near real time what is the sentiment and the tweets around my presentation. So having said that, I don't know if you have access to Twitter. If you want, and on to, um, putting it with a question with, from Vladimir, if you want to uh, tweet something about this presentation and use this hashtag, I will be able to generate a report at the end and show it to, to myself or to my manager. So for, for, for the records. So why in, I want to intentionally, I divided the, the machine learning with DevOps instead of MLOps. Mm, because basically when you think about it and you read what is the main goal of whoever builds applications that they use uh, machine learning algorithms and they are dependent of data to create an output versus DevOps, we, they both have the same goal. But at the end of the day, we want to uh, create an artifact that will be used by end users. And that artifact that doesn't get created out of the blue. There is always an idea that can be expressed as a ticket, let's say, where someone says, I would like to have a dashboard to monitor a sentiment of tweets. And then the moment that that idea starts and we start iterating to, to build it and to deploy some MVC or MVP, depending on how, what do you like, let's say a minimum variable, a prototype, the, one of the key metrics that we can measure success is that since the idea was generated or the ticket was created until the work is completed, we want to reduce this lead time. This is the main goal of DevOps, one of the main goals of DevOps. And also, when we talk about MLOps, this is what we want. We want to create an artifact that is executable and can be used and consumed by end users. And how do we do that? By as soon as possible, especially in machine learning, as soon as possible, because when we create something with data, the data changes a lot like the tweets in this case. If I were just building some module or something, the code uh, tends to remain the same. No, it doesn't vary as, as fast as possible, as fast as data, for example. So now that's, that's the main goal, I would say, like the, in the, from a general point of view. 
And now when I think about this, and maybe this is something you can take for your own work or your own projects or your own learning curve, is that one of the things that I like to do is that I like to run experiments and I like to use data and that the, the, does it, data fuels my experiments. And output of that is that I use them to assist my decision making. So, for example, uh, we will go through different use cases, but the one I was the more in the beginning, it will be interesting for me to use data of the tweets and then compare with this recording and see where the people are getting bored or where the sentiment went to negative or neutral. Just to compare maybe my pace of presenting got too boring and monotone or slow, things like that, and as is decision making. So I just happen to use machine learning and web applications to build these experiments. So because that's my why, that's what I want to do. I want to create experiments that they use data, building web application on top, and that data gets uh, through a, a machine learning algorithm. So I am kind of forced to use uh, software engineering practices to build this. And in this path, when I started doing this, there are many challenges that anyone can face by when they start building software or they want to deploy an application so it is usable by end users. But in this presentation, I will focus on two challenges. Uh, what is my solution for those two challenges so far? And these two challenges, if you think about them, are they, they were my decision. This is the problems I want to tackle because I know that they will bring me the most benefits uh, as soon as possible. I don't want to go through reading all the different hundreds of solutions out there of model registry, feature stores, uh, even processing, all this. No, I say I have, I need to build something as soon as possible. I will tackle these two challenges, but they are like the cornerstone where we can start adding on top more things in your journey in order to, if your goal is to also build well applications that happen to use machine learning. So one of the things that happened in, in real life, and I mean, when I say real life, it is at work. And also, if you have a, your own project, you will be probably involved in a scandal. If you, I don't know, create some library, you make it open source, but then whoever is using the package is introducing code vulnerabilities or is not taking care of security in their application. So this is something that is usually forgotten, let's say. When we build machine learning applications, I'm sure that security is the, one of the, the, the last things that come to mind to someone thinking if the code that I'm using is somehow secure. This is not the, usually the case, but in real life, that I like to call it real life is in work. You can know this means security, so you better doesn't matter which algorithm you are using or machine learning or whatever, you should pay attention to security in the development process, not when you deploy. So the, I want to see that as, um, let's say, as a um, user story where in order to, if you ask developers most of the time, please make sure that you are not introducing code vulnerabilities, this is challenging and this is hard to do. That's why in companies we have security architects or someone that will be in charge of security. But usually it's too late when you ask the developer to take, if you, when that is the, software, the security architect that wants to have to do this. So one approach from DevOps that is proven to improve the quality of code is that we can isolate the responsibilities and the developer can focus on developing. And while it's developing, we can adopt practices to ensure that you are not adding code vulnerabilities. And let's say that you are a front-end engineer for this application and you just want to change something without breaking security. So before I show you more in detail what I'm talking about and what is this security, I want you to understand that the application that you saw that is running sentiment analysis using pre-trained models and so on, when I designed it, the first thing I wanted to do is to start um, embracing cloud native concepts. So the application on itself on its own, it's written in a way that is self-contained. 
So meaning that I can create a Docker file and wrap it all. And if I can put it in a Docker file and create an image with it, I can put it also in a pod. And if I can put it in a pod, I am deploying it to a Kubernetes cluster, and then I can enjoy the benefits of having an application deployed on Kubernetes. It happens to be, in this case, an application where I have logic, and the logic is querying the model. And these, these, query, these queries that go to the model, they come from the front end that you saw is the hashtag I was using. And all of these things today, I don't know how familiar you are with creating infrastructure when it comes to use Kubernetes, but all I'm doing here is just defining certain files that they will be taken care of by someone else. Let's say this someone else could be a platform engineer or a DevOps engineer. And as a developer or machine learning engineer, I focus mostly in the logic and the model that I want to iterate. And all of these things, they will get automated and it just will make my life easier when it comes to deployment. And things that are happening here that we will see is that I want to also adopt, and this is uh, going circling back to the question from the beginning, I want to adopt proven industry patterns. So one of them is the GitOps um, workflow, where basically what I want to do is to have one project that I will focus on building the application there and the model, and another project that will be in charge of deployment. And these two projects, they are separate. They don't talk to each other. They talk to each other only when there is a new build, when there is a new version of the model or a new version of the front end. Now, by doing this, by having an application project and a deployment project and a Kubernetes cluster that is running somewhere, in this case, I have it in, in a cloud provider, all I'm doing is asking the Kubernetes cluster to pull that's why when I say pull, is because I'm using a GitOps pattern in which I said, you just need to go to this project and check the manifest. And if there is any change in the manifest, meaning that it could mean that there is a new image, Docker image, so you will uh, pull that new Docker image and we will release a new application. So how, how these things look like, we will see. I want to wa walk you through the concepts of this before I show them in my platform. So as you can see here in this um, previous uh, diagram, I have an application project and a deployment project. I have two separate things. But each one of them, they have their own CI CD pipeline. A CI CD pipeline that makes sense for each project. But it's still the output of one, the project one, which is the, let's say, the model train wrapped and package in a in a container or in an image. It's a, it's an it's an output that will be needed and used by the project two that has the job of updating the manifest files so Kubernetes can pull the new image automatically. So these two things that I'm doing here are having two separate projects, each one of them with their own uh, CI CD pipeline, but I still I need some communication between them. I achieve this communication by using what is called a multi-project pipeline. If you Google multi-project pipeline, you will see that this is one of the uh, choices of architecture when it comes to create a uh, microservices architecture. When you say I have different projects or different applications that they might talk to each other, but they are self-contained. And this is, this is what I'm adopting here. And I just happen to be using machine learning in the backend. And now, putting it more in a, in a more uh, rich view, if you see each one of these multi-project pipelines, sorry, this one multi-project pipeline that is made of two pipelines, project one and project two, one of them, project one, is the application that you saw that has all the logic and the calls to the APIs and the model that is querying and so on. And that application is the one that as a developer, I want to make sure that I add unit testing, that I add security scanners, that I am not doing git commit and git push of, of secrets or tokens, that this, the code quality remains. And all of that I do there. And only if that pipeline is successful, if the first pipeline from project one succeeds, meaning that my application with the, with the model uh, passed all the tests, 
Then I will trigger the creation of a second pipeline that will that will update the manifest files, and from there I will get Kubernetes. Eventually, very eventually, no, it is you can program the the pooling. We'll get those changes and deploy the new application. So now let's see how it looks like. So in this project here, you see that I have different projects because I want to model them in the, in, from different perspectives. So the crawl, the crowd UI is the one that you saw that it has the, this, this is the one with the UI of the sentiment analysis uh, application. So as you can see here, it has its own Docker file. It has its own uh, CI uh, pipeline. And if we see what it what it looks like, so you can see that here I have two things, three things. So the first step, I am building the image, meaning that when there is new code, I just want to use the Docker the Docker file, wrap it, and put it into a, a container registry. I also have an optional step that is called review that we will see more what it, what is it about. Because as I said, you as a developer, you want to make sure that your test, usability tests and all the tests that you can think of, they are successful before deploying. So I am also creating a review environment that is leveraging here what it, the, the benefits of having a Kubernetes cluster. And only when this is successful, like here that I'm showing, then I will trigger the, the deployment that will up, update the manifest files. So when we click on viewing this pipeline, you see all the things I was showing you uh, previously, they are here. First step, we are building the image. Second step, I am testing. I don't want to, I want to make sure that the dependencies that I'm using, they don't have known vulnerabilities. So imagine you can think here of NumPy, a streamlit is the thing that I'm using for the UI of these prototypes. So I'm doing a scan of those packages and the test is telling me, no worries, no vulnerabilities detected. It's very traditional. I don't know if you have seen it. It just takes half an hour to find API tokens or tokens in public repos. So I want to make sure that I am not adding that. And because these tests were successful, so it goes to the third that is deployed. And this deploy, what it does now is that it's talking to that other project that I mentioned that is separate and that other project will create what is called a downstream pipeline, and it will do its magic, which is, okay, the application with the logic and the model was created, and it generated a new tag of the image. So the first thing that we will do is to get that tag, update, update the manifest files, uh, going to the Helm chart and changing to the new tag, and then deploy. And when all of this happened, what I'm doing here basically is that I'm going to this other project, the commit uh, cluster. So as you can see, now we are in a different project, not the crowd UI. And this project is the one that if you are a DevOps engineer or if someone asks you, tell me what is the latest version that we have of the application. So you could come here, for example, and say, yes, the latest version that we have is the one corresponding to this stack. You can be more creative with the tag. At the moment, I'm just using the some SHA or some CI SHA of the pipeline. You can use a semantic version and so on. But this is this is in action what it means to have the GitOps uh, approach. Because whenever I make a change in one of these values here, a new a new version of the application will be created. So now if we go back, I have it here. So also another thing that I want to showcase by using DevOps and DevOps platforms is that you can uh, you can also embrace uh, project management uh, practices. So imagine that here I have an issue. I can also I don't know prioritize this issue, and I am the only developer in this group. So I say okay, I want to work in changing the title. You can see here I have different titles like Cloud Expo Asia, KubeCon. So let's say that I say, okay, William, you are now in another uh, event. You should update that. So I will create a merge request. And here is, is one of the first things that I want to mention that is when machine learning engineer, engin engineers can start borrowing concepts from developer workflows. We, we iterate on a model and we create merge requests to work against a model, for example. 
I, I will do a quick change. So here I will just uh, use uh, a web IDE. And let's let's do just a change to illustrate uh, the purpose of what I'm talking about. Let's say this is the code. Um, I will remove this that says Singapore and just put um, demo. Okay. So I create, um, I will create a merge request and I create this application. I, I do the commit. So now we're second to see here. So now you can see this trigger the pipeline. And now all these steps are happening automatically. And when we look, look, look to the different pipelines that I'm creating, let me stop this one. I don't want this one. I just want the one I made a change. So here, there are different things happening right now. You can think of this as if you are the developer and you were asked to do this quick change. And you just do the quick change. And, I and then someone created these YAML files with all of this automation. And all of this automation will make sure that your code contribution will go through different testing. And if it passes, everything will be OK. And you can reduce the probability that what you are deploying to a production environment or staging uh, will not introduce uh, code vulnerabilities or that the model will work in this case. So because this can take some time, because I am using a lot of libraries, I want to show you one of the things that uh, advantages of using software engineering workflows. This is the same thing just that I, I ran before. I changed the title. And we can see here that I still don't have any multi-project pipeline. I just have the pipeline of this project, the thing that concerns to this application. And on top of that, if I want to see how it looks like, I can click here in View App, and it will trigger. I, I have it ready here in case this one takes. OK, it's here. As you can see here, this review environment it's one of the advantages of saying, I am building an application that contains machine learning algorithms, and I want to test, it, to test it. I want to test it fast, and I don't want to wait until it's in production to realize that, I don't know, that the algorithm is racist, or many things that we have heard that they happen when you deploy, and then only with interacting, interacting with users is that you realize. And this review environment that I have here is one of the key benefits of saying, I want to use a cloud native application. And what it means is that whenever there is a new image of my application with a new, with the change, and for this case, I put KubeCon. I, use, I, I was thinking differently when I did this, another title instead of the Cloud Expo Asia. But what we are doing here is that you can think of another person or another role that they can try the application in this ephemeral environment that gets deployed in a Kubernetes cluster. And by using this integration between a DevOps platform and Kubernetes, I can get access to all of these ephemeral environments right on the merge request, which means that it's at the development time that I am working and testing the, the models. And when I was talking about security and so on, so here you can see that in my merge request with this little thing that I did, I ran automatically the scanners, and it didn't detect anything. So let's say that I am happy with this change. So I mark as ready this uh, code contribution, and then I click on Merge. So this means now that if we go, if you remember what we did before, now this is the uh, way to production pipeline. If this pipeline that is running here is successful, it will trigger the creation of the deployment pipeline, which is the other project that is in charge of the manifest files. So it would look something like this one. So these three here, this is the application. In this scenario, the pipeline was successful. So we say, I am successful. The image was created properly. No security um, vulnerabilities were added. The model is OK. Someone tested it in the review environment. So now we, tr we trigger the deployment one, and then we end up deploying to production. So I like to also use different tools that I could do all of this just with one tool, one DevOps. But to give you a more uh, UI-friendly perspective, this application, I am also using an Argo controller. 
So in this case, you can see that I have instructed my Kubernetes cluster using an agent that it has to pull any change in the, in the project that contains the manifest. And whenever there is a change, this UI here, and at the moment, the still the change hasn't happened because the pipeline is just, is just running. But what it will do is that automatically, this will detect that there was a change. For example, if we come here to this spot, we can see that at some point in the manifest that is living here, it, it took the, the tag of the latest application that we created. When that tag of the image changes, uh, this agent will say there is a new image, so I have to deploy a new application in a new pod. And all of these things will happen automatically. As a developer, I don't have to worry about a, as a developer, I don't have to worry about now that I built my application, I have to go to the Kubernetes cluster and you know kubectl apply and create. No, all of these things are already uh, wired in a way that you just focus on improving your algorithm or your code contribution. So this, this is what I just show you with those different images of Kubernetes cluster pulling images to a second project with charts, different pipelines. This is depicted here in this um, diagram. OK, so how are we in time? Do we still have good timing? Yeah. So now the, the challenge number two is one of my favorites, one of the funniest, and I would say one that resonates a lot with data scientists, is that you know that one of the things that is important is to automate as much as we can. But part of that automation also includes automating the allocation of the hardware. And how many of you have suffered and have, uh, you know, had tears trying to install drivers of NVIDIA and making it portable? This thing, every time I do it and I get one VM working, I make sure to freeze it and not change it ever again because this, there are lots of dependencies. So, as a data scientist, it will be great if you don't worry about installing drivers of GPUs, but that you, you can have a GPU available to you. And that the only thing you need to do is to commit code and push it to your remote. And then uh, automatically, a GPU-enabled hardware will be enabled for you to run those loads. So there are different cases that I have here that I can share with you but I will go to one of them that it resides in another project. So if we come here, I have a different project and a different group. And I think it's here. I was playing with a stable diffusion. And this other branch, I have a branch that I call testing. So in this branch, Again, so let's say that there was a very kind DevOps engineer that he defined the CI CD pipeline for me. And in this case, for this branch and this project, the pipeline, the automation, it's, it, it's, it has two steps. One, to build a neural network or training it, just, just for illustration purposes. And second, testing that the image or the Docker image that was created, it's in a healthy state. So what do I mean by that? So here, when I do this, as you can see here, I have defined some, some jobs in my pipeline. The build neural network, the first thing that it will do is to run the, the, the command of NVIDIA SMI, just to make sure that it's using the drivers and that the runner uses the, the GPU. And then it will run a simple uh, script that in this case, just for illustration purposes, I chose something that will train a neural network. Why a neural network? Because uh, this is usually the type of algorithms that can benefit from GPUs. And the tags here that I have is that I'm saying, the tag is telling, make sure that when you run this job, you are choosing the machine that is already enabled for deep learning. So let's say that if we do a little change, just let's do this for illustration purposes. No, no big changes. And I commit the changes. So this will start the pipeline and it will run these two, two steps. But let's go to a pipeline that was already executed and I'll show you something cool. So let's say that in this one, as you can see, 
we were we were training a neural network using uh, a GPU. And all, all that, in this case, when I did this commit was, I make a change to the application, let's say, and then in this case, the script of the neural network, and I just want to train. And the first step is that, first thing that happens is that when this pipeline gets created, it will automatically, using this stack, the tag deep learning that we saw, I will automatically set this type of loads I will run in hardware that has been optimized uh, using GPUs. So it's not any random hardware that I am automatically allocating in the, under the hood. I am giving to whoever did this uh, Git uh, commit, I am giving a already pre-configured uh, runner where they will run the, the, it's redundant, but it works. It will run the job that is making sure that we are using a GPU. So here you can see just because I know if you ever have tried installing this more than one time, this is pure happiness when you put the command in via SMI and you see the drivers there. When it works, you are like, yes. So just for that, I am doing it that every time that I run this job, I want to see that it is detecting my T4 GPU. So here, after it tells that, yes, I can see your drivers, I can see your GPU. Now I'm going to run the script with the demo uh, neural network. So now we can see that all these things is, is gener generates output, the architecture of the neural network, and it does the running. If you go to my instance and you clone this uh, script and you're running your computer with a GPU, the duration is like five times of these 47 seconds. So now you can think of this as in your, in your projects, in your company, in your job, it's saving time, not only of execution and training, but also I can think of, instead of using a Kubernetes cluster with pure CPU, I can allocate applications with a Kubernetes cluster with a GPU. I am also enabling automatically, the same way that I do it here when I show you before, uh, creating these pods. I can also leverage automatic creation of hardware for inference or for data processing or for training, like in this case. So th there is another example that I have here that is, is more la last time that I was presenting this. Let's see if this link still works. I was presenting this. Someone told me, but you didn't use the traditional GPU, sorry, the traditional machine learning um, workflow. So I say, you are right, I didn't use it, but let me show you how it looks like. In this case, this is a different project, this is a different uh, application, where what we are doing is training uh, NLP pipeline. And because every project has different requirements, so one thing that I made sure to do here is I said, like in the previous case, we build the image that contains the train model, the, it contains the data. I'm gonna test that the training data, it's, it has the number of tokens that I need to, to make a successful training. I'm gonna train the model, and then I'm gonna test the model. So you can think like in these two things that I'm doing here, I am bringing from different data sources, the testing data. And one thing that happens here is that on top of that, I am deploying to, I am creating reports, and I am again using DevOps practices to do this. One of the things that the intent with this project was to showcase that in many cases, we don't want to deploy 100% our new model. We want to roll it out in a controlled fashion. So you can, if you have observability and monitoring tools, you can start checking the drift of your model when only, let's say 10% of your, you have 10 pods when one pod has the latest model. How is the, the predictions or the inference going on in that pod? So if you say, I'm happy with the one pod, so let's go to two pods, let's go to three pods, when eventually you end up rolling out 100% of your application with the new model. You can think of this like doing some A-B testing with the model. And the reason I'm bringing this here is because if, you, if I click in the train model, and you can see that for this one, I was using a Tesla K80 uh, GPU to run this one. But if I go to one of the other jobs, like test model, for example, in this case, 
it is not necessary in the in the test model, for example, to use um, a, a GPU or the notify one. So I said I don't need GPU for such a, a simple job. So as you can see here in Runner, I am using commodity hardware, and this also hits on the on these hundreds of memes on the internet that they said that who was the person who forgot to turn off the GPU instance and now the bill will be very expensive. With this, I'm making sure that every time that I use GPU, it's a short lived uh, instance because it only lives while I execute this job. And as soon as this job finishes, it is killing the instance and it's also killing the usage of the GPU at that specific moment. So you don't have to worry about turning off the, the GPU. And, and this one is what I was showcasing here, this type of pipeline when we are deploying. And the last thing that I want to share is something that we have been working with. What we want to do is to listen to our audience. And it's a case study that it gave us interesting uh, insights. So again, we created a process that it's all automated. All of these things that you see here, each one of these steps, they reside in a YAML file that is runs with a scheduled pipeline where I'm taking data from the Stack Overflow API. I am filtering, I'm building a corpus using an LP context, doing some feature engineering, making sure that I don't add code vulnerabilities with security scans, and then building the application in a different project. So you saw that I like to divide uh, things. So I, I also can split the responsibility between different teams. So in this case, this process that I'm showing here is that is, it's the interesting thing is that the loader project that you can see here, this will be the one in which uh, NLP engineer, if we want to call it uh, like that, will be working in the pipeline. Here is all the code for the pipeline, all the feature engineering model, whatever, that tokenization, all the things that you can do as an NLP engineer. And this uh, project in specific, has the different steps that only make sense for the NLP engineer. And here, what we are doing is bringing the questions from a Stack Overflow API, but then there is another project that here you can think of your UI or front-end experts or front-end engineers. And this other project is the one that is only in charge of creating the front for your application. So if we, if we go back and we see this is very similar to the previous one, I have different pipelines where they are multi-project ones, where I have one, for example, this one that was successful, where the training of the model, it was able to load the questions from a Stack Overflow, and then it was able to deploy a UI for that. It's the same concept. And what was the thing that we achieved with this? And I like, that's what I like to call it a uh, case study. It's because along the same lines of what I was trying to do with uh, this audience uh, learning about the emotion and sentiment by using my custom application, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of questions about different topics that you can filter by tags on a Stack Overflow. And in my community, we wanted to know what people are asking about our product. So we say it will be a very hard job to go to Stack Overflow and try to read through all of the hundreds of questions. So what if we just automate everything and we create uh, an application that will pull the API and will give us a ranking of what are the most popular uh, tokens or topics? We Basically, we did some topic um, analysis here. And then with this, we converted a JSON full of questions to some sort of ranking that will help us to prioritize. Just so remember, when I was explaining my why, I say I want to use data to assist me in decision making. So this is one instance of that. What I'm saying is, with this, we will have a clearer view of what are the topics where we should prioritize to create educational content or to create demos or examples. And William, I don't have to get to this. Yes? Sorry for the interruption. I think we have less than one minute remaining. Yeah. So with, we'll with let's wrap close. it up. Yep. Yeah. So with this, I close with the case study. And again, just another diagram when I'm showing how by using the WOPs and two different projects, cloud native applications and automation, you can deploy the Kubernetes cluster. And with that, we have time for questions. I hope that I didn't lose you throughout the, com 
the presentation. If not, hopefully you you tweet something with the hashtag that I ask you, and I will be able to get some feedback from it. Thank yes. you, everyone. Yes, really, and thank you very much for for the talk. Uh, like I wouldn't actually lie, saying that it was quite insightful even for me, and I'm quite a seasoned, uh, you know, uh, developer and like a person in ML ML space. So like, thank you for that. Um, so for the audience, what I wanted to say is that you can still ask questions uh, in the chat. I'm taking a look at them. That's one thing. And another thing to mention is that you have to, I mean, you have a possibility to rate the talk. That's another thing which you, I suggest you to do. Uh, so let me check if we have any questions. I don't see them popping up yet. But anyway, like I have one from me uh, while the peop well, people are actually typing in their questions. So basically what I saw right now is that really like you could um, uh, train your models and deploy your models at one place and with the tool we already know. Uh, and that's quite exciting. Uh, but do you see a lot of actual companies, a lot of companies which kind of work in the ML space, which leverage data, uh, use this approach, or they still prefer fancy, you know, ML platforms and schedule their jobs um, using Airflow or, you know, kind of mm -hmm. using multiple tools for the same job instead of relying on one. Do you see mm -hmm. this kind of scenario a lot? Yeah, I have seen it. and There are customers already using it because one thing is what we can do with all the fancy new things that we see around. And the other thing is reality when you have to buy a new product and when you have to invest in a learning curve. So mm -hmm. the transition is easier when you already know one, one tool and you say, I can start using this to start doing something, to start iterating. And um, to, um, to add on that, as I said, I focus only into challenges and how I can solve it with this tool. But I do use uh, Apache Airflow for some very specific uh, workflows. And the only thing I do differently is that I also integrate this pipeline with the uh, pipelines from Apache Airflow. Um, we have different uh, pipelines also where we want to extract different things from our cloud database. And once we do it in a different pr product, we disponibilize it somewhere where then the more DevOps stage can take care of it. So I believe that this is what, uh, where it comes to. You learn to do something with what you already know, so the learning curve is uh, shorter. And then you will squeeze and you will find what are the limitations of your current approach. And then you can have an informed decision of what are the new modules that you need. So anyone can tell me, yeah, that, that doesn't solve the feature store component. I say, yeah, it doesn't. You should invest on that. But now you know that that's what you need. You don't, you don't need that uh, platform in order to automate your testing, unit testing, deployment, um, even packaging the model. Someone can also tell me because I am just, because I don't know, I cannot see the questions. I am asking myself questions that I have been asked before. So what about the model registry? So yes, we have integrations where you can use the model registry that you want and we will just push the artifact there also using the, the pipeline. But we have seen other companies that they treat the model as a, they don't treat it as if it's something special. It's just another binary, the model. So I put it in my container registry if I have it in an image, or I put it as a package in my package registry. And package registry and container registries are two things that have been invented for more than a decade. So it's tested. So, or if you want a model registry tool with fancy things, scores, scorecards, go for it. But be, before you go there, there are already many things that you can do without investing a cent. All right. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. sounds sounds very nice, this kind of approach. Thanks for shedding light on this. Uh, okay, so with this, I think we were approaching the end of the slot which we are located with. So mm -hmm. I would say that um, we should probably proceed now to the discussion zone so that we can chat a little bit more uh, and have a nice discussion between all of us and the audience. So let's move there. Thank you very much again, uh, William, and see you there. Okay, bye.